We're just going to take a minute to bring you a word from our sponsor, Scentbird. It seems like there are countless subscription services out there, and more are coming out every day. But Scentbird really stood out to me because I think it's useful and it's a lot of fun. It would also be an amazing Valentine's gift for a man or a woman. For just $16 a month, they send a sample bottle of cologne or perfume. And this isn't some tiny bottle you usually get samples in. Scentbird bottles are about 8 times bigger than the typical sample bottle, and they usually last 30 days. They have over 600 brands to choose from, including high-end ones like Prada, Gucci, Versace, as well as indie labels like Vince Camuto, The Harmonist, and Confessions of a Rebel. If that sounds like a lot of brands, that's because it is, but don't feel overwhelmed. They have a great, easy quiz you can take, and they'll send you something that matches your personality. Scentbird has sponsored several other videos, and we're super thankful for them, and they've sent me some amazing colognes, so I'm super excited to try out the new ones they just sent me. This month, I got colognes from Confessions of a Rebel, Dolce & Gabbana, and Sense of Wood. They all smelled really unique, but I really enjoyed Get a Room from Confessions of a Rebel. The vanilla scent in it is just amazing. If there were a candle with that scent, I'd have it burning all the time. In fact, I'm wearing it right now, and I work at home alone. Scentbird has a great deal for currently listed viewers. Use C-Listed to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. So you'll just pay $7. Great news for all my Canadian viewers. Scentbird is now available in Canada Day, so make sure you check them out. Number 3. James Pritchard In the fall of 1995, 60-year-old James and 52-year-old Lila Pritchard lived in Pebble Beach, California. The couple had been married for 28 years, and they had three children together. For 30 years, James worked at a high school in Pebble Beach as a guidance counselor. Lila, who had her master's degree, was a substitute teacher for a few years. But she eventually stopped working for the school board to be a homemaker and raise their three children. At some point in the mid-1990s, Lila and James got the internet. Lila became obsessed with chat rooms and she made several friends online. She spent a lot of her free time online, much to the annoyance of James. On the night of November 7th, 1995, James confronted Lila about how much time she spent online. It was an intense fight and Lila eventually said that she wanted a divorce. James snapped and grabbed a pillow. He put it over 52-year-old Lila's face and held it down for at least four minutes. Tragically, this was enough to kill Lila. Realizing what he had done, James decided to cover up the murder. He got Lila's body into the car and drove to Highway 1. He parked on the shoulder of the road and put Lila's body in the driver's seat. He was going to stage a car accident to make it look like Lila died that way. Unfortunately for James, a California Highway Patrol officer happened upon their car. He found Lila's dead body in the driver's seat. James explained that his wife suddenly became ill, pulled over to the side of the road, and then she lost consciousness. James was released that night, and the investigators examined the scene. They found that things didn't line up with what James said. He was brought to the police station for an interview. At the police station, James admitted he killed his wife during an argument about her online usage. He was arrested for the murder of his wife. Many people were shocked by his arrest. James was usually one of the first people to show up for work at the high school, and he was known to stay late to help students. He seemed like the last person who would kill someone. On March 14, 1996, James Pritchard pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter as part of a plea deal. He was sentenced to the maximum, which was 11 years in prison. He was released from prison in 2007 at the age of 72. James Pritchard is considered the first person convicted of an internet-related murder. Number 2. William Earl McClellan William McClellan, who went by his middle name, Earl, met Juanita, the woman he'd eventually marry, in 1981 
when they're both working for the Free Library of Philadelphia, which is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania's library system. Juanita was a computer service technician who later oversaw the installation of the internet in library branches. Juanita was known for her improvisational skills when it came to setting up computers and networks. Supposedly, she could hotwire a computer with a paper clip, a rubber band, and a wad of gum. Because of her abilities, she was nicknamed MacGyver after the titular character of the ABC television show. Earl and Juanita were wed in 1988 and they settled in West Philadelphia. Juanita gave birth to two children, a daughter named Patrice and a son named Will. In January 1998, Patrice was eight and Will was five. Patrice loved reading and was rarely seen without a book. She was also a talented saxophone player. Will was smaller than other boys his age. He was described as obedient and intense. In the 1990s, Juanita often worked online at home. Earl, who was an electrician, left the library system to work for the city and commerce streets departments. Earl was described as a mild-mannered family man. By outward appearances, the McClellan family seemed like a typical happy family. But problems were brewing in the house. On January 6, 1998, Earl and Juanita started arguing. Initially, the fight was about Juanita's long working hours. Then they started fighting about money and then the children. Juanita said she was passionate about her career and loved computers, but her children never came second. They were always cared for and fed. Then Earl accused Juanita of having an affair with a woman online. Earl had been harassing her about this for a while. Juanita had been corresponding with women online. One of the women she emailed had the username Shy Butch. On Juanita's America Online profile, under marital status, she had written, Lonesome. Earl would stand behind her as she used the computer and insult her. On the night of the big blow up, at about 10 o'clock, Juanita was fed up and she left the family's home. She went to Temple University's computer room and stayed there for about two hours. She returned home just after midnight. She found the front door chained so she couldn't get in. So she left again. She returned home at about 2.30 a.m. and forced her way into the house. She found a message written in black marker on the wall in the living room. It read, Shy Butch, you can be. Love Earl. I always gave you everything you wanted. Now you are free. Love Earl. Juanita bolted upstairs and went to the children's rooms. Eight-year-old Patrice and five-year-old Will had both been stabbed to death. Will had been stabbed so many times that when the police examined his body, they could not determine how many times he had been stabbed. Patrice had been stabbed once in the back. The bloody knife was found on the bedroom floor. Earl had come himself on the neck and the chest, but his wounds turned out to be superficial. Juanita called the police and officers were there in minutes. Earl was taken to the hospital. Juanita told the officers that Earl had been harassing her about her online usage and he believed she was having an affair with a woman. The police did not find any evidence that Juanita was having an affair. Earl was treated at the hospital for his superficial wounds and he was released. He was immediately taken into custody. He admitted that he entered his children's bedroom while they were sleeping. He stuffed a sock into their mouths and then stabbed them. He wanted to kill himself, but he couldn't go through with it. Earl was subsequently charged with the murders of his two children. The police learned that Earl may have been plotting the murders all day. At about 6.40 a.m. on the morning of the murders, a man had called a local television station. 
He complained about his wife's internet obsession and he kept saying that something bad was going to happen. 43 year old William Earl McKellen went to trial 18 months after the murders in June 1999. During the trial, he decided to change his plea from not guilty to guilty to avoid the death penalty. He was sentenced to life in prison. There is no record of William Earl McKellen in Pennsylvania's inmate database. So that means he was either released or he died in prison. If Earl McKellen is alive today, he would be about 65 years old. Number 1. Samuel Manzi Samuel Manzi was born in February 1982 in California. When he was 5, he moved with his parents, Nick and Dolores, across the country to Jackson, New Jersey. In the first grade, Samuel started to show disturbing behavior. He was evaluated by psychologists who concluded that he was a sad little boy who fought a lot. Samuel's mother thought that this was an odd conclusion. She didn't think that her son got into many fights. Instead, he tended to bottle things up. Samuel continued to get in trouble at middle school, but nothing too serious. He had a few friends, but he was mostly an outcast. He wasn't involved in any sports or social groups. He was teased by many of the other students. They called him Manzi the Pansy. When Samuel was 13, he told his parents that no one understood him and he had suicidal thoughts. Samuel spent a lot of his free time online. Samuel's parents knew he used the internet a lot, but what they did know was that he spent a lot of time in chat rooms for gay men and teens. When Samuel was 14, he met Stephen Simmons, a 42-year-old convicted pedophile. In August 1996, Stephen visited Simmons, who lived in Holbrook, New York. They had a sexual encounter, and Samuel stayed the night at Simmons' home. The next day, Samuel told his parents they had slept in the woods. Over the next year, Samuel and Simmons continued to have a sexual relationship. They met in person several times. Samuel's parents, Nick and Dolores, noticed Simmons' phone number frequently on their phone bill, but they had no idea who he was. So one day they called him. Simmons lied and said he was just an online friend who helped Samuel with his computer issues. The Manzies didn't suspect that Simmons was sexually abusing their son, but they told Simmons to stop communicating with him. Samuel's behavioral problems continued into high school. He ended up dropping out in his freshman year. The school officials told his parents that he could only come back after he received a psychiatric evaluation. In the summer of 1997, when Samuel was 15, he started seeing a psychiatrist. After two sessions, the psychiatrist suggested they be placed in a structured program because he needed more help than he could provide. Samuel began the program in August 1997. In the program, he talked about his relationship with Simmons. The doctor who ran the program notified the Division of Youth and Family Services and Samuel's parents and told them about the relationship. At this point, Samuel's behavior was worse than it had ever been he was frequently fighting with his parents. One night, Samuel threw the TV remote control at his father. The police were called and Samuel was taken to a medical center for a psychiatric evaluation. He was sent home that night. Several law enforcement agencies wanted to arrest Stephen Simmons and they wanted Samuel's help. They had taken Samuel's hard drive, which had their chat logs. Samuel cooperated and told the investigators about his relationship with Simmons. Then they wanted Samuel to get back in contact with Simmons. He ended up calling Simmons twice, once on September 17, 1997 and once again two days later. 
Both calls were recorded. Initially, Samuel was happy to go along with the sting operation, but then he changed his mind. He smashed the recording device he called Simmons. He told him about the sting operation. Simmons told him it was okay and he would face the consequences. The next day, Samuel told his doctor he had contacted Simmons and told him about the sting operation. That day, Samuel also told his doctor they had fantasies about killing a child. The doctor tried to get Samuel hospitalized that night, but the hospital would not admit him. So Samuel was sent back home. That same day, Stephen Simmons was arrested and his bail was set at $50,000. Simmons couldn't afford to pay that, so he sat in jail. On September 27, 1997, 15-year-old Samuel Manzi was home alone. His parents were out of town on business. 11-year-old Eddie Werner knocked on his door. Eddie was selling candy and wrapping paper for a school fundraiser. 15-year-old Samuel was able to convince Eddie to come inside. Samuel led Eddie to his bedroom where he tried to get the boy to engage in sexual acts but he resisted. Samuel then ordered Eddie to take off his clothes. Samuel was much larger than Eddie, so Eddie did as he was told. Samuel then wrapped the cord from an alarm clock around Eddie's neck and strangled him. He continued to strangle the 11-year-old boy for 40 minutes. Once the boy was dead, Samuel put a necktie around Eddie's neck and took a photo of his body. He then stuffed the body into a suitcase. Samuel then dragged the suitcase into a wooded area in the neighborhood. He pulled the body out of the suitcase and left it in the wooded area. When Eddie Werner didn't come home, his parents reported him missing. The next day, Nick and Dolores heard that Eddie was missing and they got a horrible feeling in the pits of their stomachs. They wondered if their son had anything to do with Eddie's disappearance. Dolores confronted Samuel and he admitted they had killed the boy. 15-year-old Samuel Manzi was promptly arrested. In March 1999, Samuel Manzi pleaded guilty to first-degree murder. In April 1999, he was sentenced to 70 years of prison. The judge said he wouldn't be able to apply for parole until he had served 59 years. So that means he wouldn't have been able to apply for parole until he was 74 years old. But his lawyers appealed and his sentence was changed. He will be able to apply for parole in 2027 when he's 45 years old. In November 1999, Stephen Simmons was sentenced to five years in prison for sexually abusing Samuel Manzi. After Eddie's murder, there was a lot of finger pointing regarding who was responsible for his murder. Many people blame the mental health care system for not hospitalizing Samuel, even under his doctor's orders, before the murder. Newsweek blamed the internet in an article entitled, Did the Net Kill Eddie? and the New York Post called Samuel a cyber psycho. Some other people blamed the PTA for doing a fundraiser that had children going door to door. Other people blamed Stephen Simmons, claiming he had groomed Samuel. Simmons blamed the justice system for the murder. He said had his bail not been so high, he might have been released. He believes that Samuel would have called him instead of hurting Eddie. While the judge thought that Samuel's violent behavior was simply caused by his bad attitude. Samuel Manzi is currently 40 years old and he is serving a sentence in the New Jersey State Prison in Trenton, New Jersey. Thank you so much for watching today's video. And now here's a clip from our latest video, Three Creepy Cases of Lost Time, from our new YouTube channel, Paranormally Listed. Matthews called the base at around 8.45 p.m. His colleague said that someone would pick him up in a minute. 
While Matthews was waiting for his ride, he saw lights in the sky moving towards him. Suddenly, he was overcome with fear. He picked up the phone and called the base again to tell them something strange was happening. His colleague asked him where he had been. Matthew said he hadn't moved from where he had been standing in front of the grocery store. His colleague said that the truck pulled up at 8.50 p.m. about five minutes after he made his call and he didn't see anyone waiting. Matthews made a second phone call to the base at 9.45 p.m. It had been nearly an hour, but Matthews thought it only had been a couple of minutes. Someone picked Matthews up and we got to the base. He was heavily questioned. You can find a link to the rest of the video on the screen now. There is also a link to the channel in the description box below this video. Thanks again for watching.